først så kommer ind, så sidder der to mænd på samme alder med mig, sådan cirka, og siger, hvad så? Skal du have en gin tonic? Øh, nej, det skal jeg altså ikke rigtig have, fordi jeg er ikke derhen endnu. Jo jo, sæt dig nu ned, nu skal vi lige snakke sammen. Vi havde, fra at komme fra og bruge 10 minutter, endte med at have tre timers mest fantastiske møde. Og de blev mine investorer. Det var så fantastisk. Det endte med, at vi fandt ud af, at det jeg kunne, det kunne de ikke. Og det de kunne, kunne jeg ikke. Så det endte med, at det blev en kontrakt, hvor vi gik i samarbejde, og de blev mine investorer. Nu vil jeg så øh, lige våge at påstå en ting, fordi jeg synes, min holdning er, at vejen frem det er at finde investorer. Fordi ellers kan du ikke komme op på niveau forholdsvis hurtigt. Det er jo fint nok, hvis man har en vision om, at man vil sidde som baggårdsdesigner, men hvis du gerne vil ud og være en global virksomhed, så er det vigtigt, at du har den muskelmasse økonomisk og driftigt, at du kan komme op i gear. Så er du, så vil jeg lige påpege et par ting omkring investorer. Do's and don'ts. Jeg ved ikke, om nogen af jer har, har I overhovedet tanker om at få investorer. Jeg tænker, at jeres produkt og jeres koncept øh, er så unikt, at I gerne vil have investorer på jer. Ja. Fordi det, der er rigtig vigtigt, og her taler jeres erfaring, det er rigtig, rigtig vigtigt, at man finder selvfølgelig den rigtige investor. Der er meget stor forskel på investor. Og en ting er sikkert, der opstår altid konflikt. Altid. Altså, man kan have gin tonic tre timers møde, man kan gå i samarbejde, du gør det, du gør. Der opstår altid konflikt. Det er den ene ting. Sygdom, intern krise, ekstern krise, personale fungerer ikke, dit produkt fungerer ikke, ø- økonomisk krise. Altid er der udfordringer. Der kan være en konkurs, der lige pludselig kommer. Der kan være et exit. Der kan være, at den investor, du har blevet, du er blevet købt op af, selv bliver opkøbt. Der er 10.000 muligheder for, at det kan gå galt. Men det er så den ene ting. Men husk at vælge den rigtige investor. Be wise. Kun virkelighedens verden overgår filmen. Så so don't get hung up on money. Be wise and get hung up on your talent. That's what's working. Øhm, midler og processer. Hvem gør hvad? Hvem kommer med hvad? Økonomi. Hvem har beføjelsen? Hvem beslutter hvad? Øhm, det der med, at man har en øh, god øh, aktionær over en, så kommer nogle gode kontrakter, så kan man altid lave andre aftaler og andre kontrakter. Alting kan man skrive sig ud af, men husk at vente de 10.000 spørgsmål, inden man går i samarbejde med dem. Øhm, og så skal du gøre op med, hvem er du? Fordi når du går i samarbejde med en investor, så skal du være diplomatisk, og du skal, være, du skal altid arbejde og tiltale hinanden i en god tone. Men det er vigtigt, at du kender dit værd. Og det er vigtigt, at du forstår, at kompromisløsninger med en investor, som tilbyder dig en platform, drift og mange ting og sager, at du forstår, at de løsninger, det er bedst for din virksomhed og de fremadrettede produkt, ikke din egen lille niche, som handler om design i mit tilfælde. Så vid, hvem der har know-how og kompetencerne. Det er rigtig vigtigt. Sørg for, at du er driver, for du står for udviklingen i brandet. Din personlige kommunikation er jo også enormt vigtig. Hvordan kommunikerer du folk? For det første folk, de tænker på, når du kommer ind ad døren, hvis du snakker med en investor, det er et, klarhed i dit produkt. Hvad ved du? Hvad er dit koncept? Er det unikt? Er det skalerbart? Kan der tjene penge? Men faktisk også, hvordan du er som menneske. Hvem er du som menneske? Er du diplomatisk? Går du med? Er du visionær? Er du kreativ? De ting er rigtig vigtige i forhold til en investor. Men hvad fik jeg så i forhold til DK Company? Jamen, jeg fik en fælles driftsplatform. Jeg fik en ny businessmodel, fordi de havde egne fabrikker. Det vil sige, at priserne på mine produkter blev halveret i forhold til mine kolleger. Selvom det måske var nabofabrikken, der sad syde. Det vil sige, at konkurrencedygtige priser, større indtjening, bedre kvalitet og hands-on direkte. Udover det, så fik jeg jo lige pludselig en medarbejderstab og et kontor, og alt var finansieret af dem, frem for at jeg gjorde det selv. Så der var rigtig mange fordele, der fulgte med, øhm, som jeg i dag er rigtig lykkelig for. I 2013, der blev det jo så fuldstændig et etableret brand. Det startede i 2009, Karen Bay Simonsen i 2013. Øh, der blev det rigtig fint. Vi havde en, en, en fin omsætning, vi havde en god indtjening, vi lancerede en mindful fitness-linje, og vi udviklede på produktet. 
vi ændrede kollektionernes leveringer. Fordi det, der er vigtigt, det er en ting, at du er kreativ på dit design og dit produkt. Du skal også være kreativ for dit businessmodel. Fordi hvordan ser markedet ud? Hvad vil folk have? I 2015 lancerede jeg en One-kollektion, som baseret på en businesslinje. Det kom så af mange af de kvinder, jeg sidder i bestyrelsen med. De kom altid og spurgte mig, som en gang, hvordan skal jeg klæde mig? Jamen altså, jeg har brug for det og det og det. Jeg har ikke tid til at bestille. Jeg har ikke tid til at gå i butikker. Det var en businesslinje, som bestod af fem styles. Og det blev en kæmpe succes. Kommer ud to gange om året og baseret på den måde, en forretningskvinde, den måde, du lever dit liv på lige p.t. Så vi skaber altså i forbindelse med 2015 og businesslinjen nye leveringer, nye betalingsbetingelser. Øh, kunderne skal forsikres, det er jo andre tider i dag, og rettighederne skal være klare. Vi finder ud af at undersøge adfærd i kultur, det er det vi gør, det er det vi bygger vores one kollektion på. Og det bliver faktisk vores ramme for vores kollektioner fremadrettet. Så det er også en anderledes måde at få tingene på. I 2016, der lancerer jeg The Icon Collection. Det er noget helt andet. Jeg har tre linjer nu i mit brand. Jeg har Icon, som er My Playground, som er en peace driven kollektion, som handler om uh, spændende, sjove designs, hvor jeg ikke er begrænset af farver, eller pris eller kvalitet. Det er The Fun Game. Så har jeg så uh, min mainline, Karen by Simonsen, som er en trendbaseret kollektion, men også kommersielt på pris og kvalitet. Og så har jeg min businesslinje. Så det, jeg har gjort hele vejen igennem, de her mange år, jeg har været i gang der, jeg har hele tiden udviklet på design og produkt. Det kommer fuldstændig passioneret af øh, lige ud af landevejen. Men jeg har også formået at udvikle min businessmodel i forhold til, hvordan markedet ser ud worldwide. Vi ser jo primært i hele Nordeuropa, men også i gang både i Kanada og Mellemøsten. Hvis jeg lige skal summere op, så, øh, så vil jeg gerne øh, lige øh, skrive, hvorfor iværksætter sammen med en investor. Øh, hvis du er iværksætter, du gerne vil nå langt, hvis du gerne vil ud på et globalt niveau, så er du nødt til at have know-how, kompetencer og cash, og du har ikke det hele selv. Så kend dine egne begrænsninger og vid, at du er et helt unikt talent, men vid også, eller kan jeg sige, be smart. Omgiv dig med de mennesker, som har de kompetencerne og den know-how, du ikke har. I dag giver i hvert fald mit partnerskab med DK Company mening, og det gjorde det også dengang. Jeg bekymrer mig med, eller optages af at blive bedre og stadigvæk formå at være innovativ på business model og produkt. Jeg har fortalt lidt omkring min brand facts, men som sagt, vi kan sige det tidligere, jeg laver også solbriller øh, med et øh, dan- andet dansk firma, Collabs, er også en rigtig god måde at komme ud i markedet på og se verden globalt. Øh. Så øh, det sidste og gode råd, jeg kan give jer, om I står på startlinjen, eller om I står midt i det, eller I er godt på vej ind i en stor succes, så vil jeg bare sige, be resilient. Det er rigtig vigtigt, fordi at verden forandrer sig hele tiden. Og er du det, så bliver det en rigtig god dag. Så det var ordene for mig. Tak til Karen Simonsen, og tak fordi du havde lyst til at dele din meget ærlige historie. Fordi det er jo, at de ting, der er svært, og de ting, der samtidig går galt, at vi, at vi skal lære. Men øh, bliv her, fordi den næste halv time bliver det rigtig spændende, og noget, som øh, vi ikke har rigtig har, har øh, fortalt noget om før på de her i værk- og vækstdage. Nemlig, hvad sker der, når øh, en stor bank vælger at samarbejde med en lille startup? Fordi vi ser jo i stigende grad, at øh, de etablerede virksomheder, ja, de vil rigtig, rigtig gerne lege med øh, startups. Og hvad er fordele og ulemper ved det? Ja, de etablerede virksomheder, de vil jo gerne, de ved rigtig meget om, hvordan man skaber sund forretning. Og iværksætterne, ja, det er dem, der har idéerne, øh, som de store ofte mangler i forhold til at gå ind i en innovativ fremtid. En af de virksomheder herhjemme, som er kommet allerlængst med det, allerlængst med at professionalisere det her samarbejde, det er Danske Bank. Og øh, Pascal, <laughs> vi skal lige have dem på se. Pascal øh, Franke, som leder Danske Banks Growth Team, kan gerne komme herop. Øh, han er her, og øh, Martin øh, Bjerg 
Kjærgaard, værsgo og sæt jer der. Øh, som er en af de startups, som Danske Bank har taget under sine vinger. Og jeg skal lige sige, at debatten kommer til at foregå på engelsk, øh, fordi Pascal er engelsktalende. Og det jeg kan sige for, at I forstår, hvordan vi snakker om nu, det er, at Danske Bank yder lån til det, man kunne kalde vækstorienterede startups, der har en forudsigelig omsætning. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. Welcome Martin, welcome Pascal. I just promised that you will talk about the benefits and the pitfalls of bringing established companies like Danske Bank and entrepreneurs like Martin together. Pascal, we're going to do this a little bit different. Pascal, I'd like you to tell us what it is that Martin does, and then afterwards I'd like you, Martin, to tell us what it is Pascal and his team does in Danske Bank. Uh, so you first. Yeah, I guess uh, introducing Martin could take the entire 20 minutes and also <laughs> what uh, Rainmaking is doing. Um, but basically, start, having started out like 11 years ago uh, with the idea of like continuously putting out companies, tech companies, um, they have then basically uh, ventured into uh, co-working spaces, um, um, accelerator program, uh, startup bootcamp, and then also basically that's how we are now working together, um, so for helping uh, corporates on actually their sort of like digitalization journey, um, and um, yeah, trying to innovate basically. Yes. So you have more to tell about what it is that Raymond can ask? Um, yeah, basically um, now that's basically how we uh, work together is like to sort of like uh, target a specific segment, basically utilizing their uh, reach into the startup um, ecosystem, but also the knowledge of like you know having I think started like 30 companies within the past 11 years, um, some of them very successfully, some of them you know still running, some of them maybe less successful, but basically utilizing that knowledge um, of actually working like a startup. I think that's often what uh, what corporates are lacking. Yes, and then you, Martin. What is it actually that Martin, that Pascal does at Danske Bank? It's very interesting to listen to what, what you do, presented from someone else. <laughs> it's a good exercise. Um, so obviously, Danske Bank is a is a big bank, uh, and historically, Danske Bank has not been very eager to support startups. I think that's not offending anyone to to say that. But a few years ago, that changed, and uh, a little team was put together that Pascal is working in, and Pascal and, and a couple of other people from Danske Bank came to us and said, we would like to become friends with the startups, uh, we would like to support the startups, and, uh, and that was where, where, where it, it, uh, it all started. And then together we built the hub, um, which is a, a platform to simply help startups. There is no revenue model, it doesn't cost anything to use it. It's all by the kindness of Danske Bank uh, and the competence of Danske Bank and Rainmaking together. So that has been the nature of how we work together. And, and concerning your company, Rainmaker, what, what is it that Pascal and his team can help you do or achieve? Um, so I, I think in a way, in, in, in this case, it's, it's maybe a bit more us helping Danske Bank. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> because Danske Bank knows a lot of things very well, that where we surely cannot help them. But there's one thing that we know a lot about, and that is the startup scene. And that is how it is to be an entrepreneur. Because as Pascal mentioned, we started 30 of our own companies based on our own ideas, our own money that we built from scratch over the last 11 years. And some of them have been really well, some of them have failed. We learned a lot from that as well. And we have our own co-working spaces with 1,300 entrepreneurs sitting there every day around us. So we sit in the middle of the startup scene. We have our accelerator startup bootcamp where we help 500 startups, more than 500 startups now, uh, raise more than a billion uh, euros. Um, so in that sense, we work very closely with startups and we are entrepreneurs ourselves. And Danske Bank was eager to work with someone like us to better understand the startup scene. Mm. That means that's why, why do you need to understand the startup scene? Yeah, so for us it was basically interesting to reposition us, um, to also like, you know, get the, like the um, reach to the startup ecosystem. Um, one is like from a societal perspective, supporting the growth of Denmark uh, or the Nordics and supporting startups in their growth journey. But also because we see that, of course, as a corporate, you can learn from startups um, a lot uh, from their ways of working. Uh, and that's basically, that was the ambition. Um, but as you rightly mentioned, from the beginning on, basically, we, it was labeled as a moonshot project, so like a strategic project that was mandated by the executive board, but there was no monetization thought behind it. And I think that was also like um, really, really important because often when you do those kind of things, 
you don't really know exactly where it's going to take you. So if we had to show the, the monetization aspect in it from the very beginning on, I guess we would have uh, shut it down straight away. So of course there's a lot of bankers in a bank like uh, yeah. Danske Bank, but it's not really bankers that you're looking for when you are recruiting for your team, is it? No, exactly. Uh, we actually very much appreciate, and we've had this uh, talk actually at uh, Tech Barbecue also, that the experience that entrepreneurs have are extremely valuable to corporates. And I think that's also a change that we can see now, where the corporates are actually looking into skill sets that you know entrepreneurs have, but at the same time also, therefore, therefore actually encouraging also like the, 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 the natural um, rotation of people going from the corporate that can also bring in value to startups, and then, of course, uh, going back uh, back into uh, the corporate. So, so if you could uh, tell us about one specific thing that has influenced Danske Bank, because you deal with young entrepreneurs, with innovative entrepreneurs, yeah. how have you changed as a bank because of that? I think uh, the biggest, really the biggest impact is the uh, cultural aspect within the organization. Because then, so sort of like it's, and often you would see that, you know, when corporates come to like those kind of events, uh, or they go to co-working space, let's say the Copenhagen FinTech Lab or to Rainmaking Loft, it's almost like an innovation zoo. And suddenly, like, you know, as a corporate, uh, you know, you see startups or entrepreneurs and like, wow, so, you know, what are those guys doing here? Um, I think it's, the, it's a lot about like the cultural change within an organization to bring them closer to what's happening outside the organization. Uh, you know, what are the new, uh, new business models, you know, new technologies, uh, because I think that's often where folks are quite distant. Um, so I think the cultural aspect has been extremely strong and then of course also like the, the different ways of working. Um, I think that's that these, these two things. Mm. So, so how have you changed? Give us a specific example. Yeah, I mean like a lot of like buzzwords, uh, I guess, and, and most corporates are, and are actually basing with minimum value pro uh, products, MVPs, uh, working in sprints, uh, you know, working agile, cross-functional teams, uh, working with external partners. Uh, and I think that has laid like a really strong foundation because that's really what people are looking towards within the bank, towards our team and like you know, using the hub as a showcase um, uh, for that. And uh, yeah, there was a lot of um, sort of like barriers we had to break down within the organization and now basically that work is done. So for me as a customer, a bank customer yeah. at Danske Bank, how will I as a customer where you deal with my finances, how will I know that you have had that culture change? From a uh, customer perspective, um, I, I'm not sure, but I guess you're alluding to maybe the, the Danske Bank growth and well, basically from uh, from the customer perspective, we basically have like a, a quite large team that's looking into the customer experience, journeys, digitalization, um, really making it uh, seamless for the customer. But of course, it's like, it's not a, a, you know, that doesn't happen from one day to another. Yeah. So I would say like the digital it's a part. journey. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so yes? I have an interesting story around that yes. question, right? What has changed the Danske Bank? Because Danske Bank has a, uh, has an initiative around training some of the advisors to understand startups because it used to be the way that the person you would least get advice from when starting up your company would be your bank advisor, yes. right? It would be the silliest advice ever. Uh, do a very long business plan, it's all about the budget, this and that, where you as a startup founder know that you can make as many budgets as you want, but none of them are going to be correct, so why bother? Uh, find a customer, start delivering, and build an MVP, these kind of things matter much more than sitting and fantasizing about five-year projections. Uh, so you would normally stay away from your bank advisor, and then the bank realized that that was a problem, <laughs> uh, and, and, and therefore they started training their bank advisors in a new way, at least some of them, right? Not everyone, but so, some so, of them. So what is the difference? What, what are your uh, bank advisors today? How would he deal with a startup on something? Yeah. So basically we started that um, September last year, again together with Rainmaking, like, you know, based it on uh, like the good collaboration we really had. Um, so then last September we, we sort of like conceptualized and looked into so what is it really that um, the needs are of entrepreneurs and how can we support that um, as a bank, like with our knowledge that we have. So then together with Rainmaking developed the value proposition and at the same time trained uh, selected advisors across the Nordics that we then basically allowed, okay, so you can go out to those kind of events, um, you know, build your network um, because like the biggest, the two biggest issues that we've seen through the, the interviews with entrepreneurs across the Nordics is that they said really, if I had an advisor that just understands me, that as, as Martin alluded to, like doesn't ask me for like a 10 page business plan, but maybe ask me for the pitch deck, which, which I have anyways, 
Um, so that understanding, speaking the language, understanding their business models, the way they're working. And then they said, and the icing of the cake would be if you would basically open up your network, if you could um, uh, supply us with that and maybe connect us with the right business angel and so forth. And that's basically what we've now done. Like we put this team together, allowed them to go out and not spend the time at the desk, but actually meet startups, sit at the co-working spaces. And, uh, and by that, uh, being able to really support them. And, and uh, now we have basically advice that have a really, really strong uh, network. And of course, again, that's also a journey, um, but I think it's, it's really important and a good step. And there was one fun episode, because uh, we had some business angels coming in to say what their investment criteria are and how they uh, assess if they want to invest in a startup or not. Uh, and then we had the advisors sitting there. And then this, one of the business angels mentioned that if a startup founder had went bust with another company, that was actually a fine thing, because then he also had that experience, mm. and he could learn from that, and probably less likely would do it again. And he wouldn't panic if things got a bit difficult, because he's been through it. And then all the bank guys just turned completely pale and said, but if in, in Danske Bank, if someone has went bust with a company, had filed for bankruptcy with their company, we could probably never ever touch them again. Yeah. Uh, so that, that's a big cultural Definitely. difference. A yes. big difference. Yeah. So, so Pascal, because you know banks, they are, of course, you're known for having a very strict um, risk policy. Uh, but I guess being an entrepreneur is all about taking risks. So how, how do you merge that culture of not taking risks as a yeah. bank and then dealing with very risk-taking companies? Yeah, absolutely. I think first of all, like when it comes to supporting startups or like um, advising startups, it's, of course the funding part is a big part in it, um, that's for sure. And that's basically also where we're saying like we don't compete with the with the business angels, we don't compete with the VCs, and I think we'll probably be, do, uh, be doing a terrible job on that. But just by being able to have advice and also like people within the credit department to actually understand those business models. Because let's say if you uh, have a SaaS business model, you come to Danske Bank and you say like, you know, I have a million users, but you know, I have negative profits because I'm investing all my money into the into the growth and like expanding to other markets. Uh, but I would like to have a loan or like an overdraft facility. And then basically the, the, the credit officer said like, first of all, you probably wouldn't understand what you, what you mean. And then he would say like, negative profit, for sure we can't give a loan. And that's basically, I think the example is also Billy um, being a customer of Danske Bank where we really you know, have the, the credit department understanding, like selected people, understanding the business models and by basically having a better understanding, being able to, to, to understand the risk in it, then with still having the same risk policy but being able to su uh, supply uh, loans in those cases, for example. So Martin, do you have any advice for, uh, for Danske Bank and, and other established companies concerning the risk element when you deal with entrepreneurs? So I, I think the work that's being done now is very uh, spot on. Uh, actually looking at the criteria from VCs and business angels who are investing their own money, the business angels anyway, that's really their own money. So they they make quite clever decisions. Whereas the system in Danske Bank has been very old fashioned when it comes to startups. It's been built around big corporates with a, and also smaller companies, but with a long track record where you cannot navigate in that uh, same way for a startup. So now that work is being done and that is that is brilliant. So advice, I would say, at, uh, be mindful not to give too many loans too quickly uh, because if that happens then everything can be rolled back because then there'll be a bad experience. Uh, so a lot of loans will default mm. and then it'll be rolled back. So it's completely on the right track but also not go too fast on that and just lend out a, a, a million, uh, a billion. A million is fine, a billion is too much because if you lose too much money, then the CFO or CEO will say, it's too dangerous, let's mm. go back to the old way. Yeah. That would be terrible. So, so do you have an advice for, for entrepreneurs who want to deal with established companies like Danske Bank? Um, yeah, from that part, I think you really um, have to also be careful of like how you're choosing that partner because at the end of the day, you also have to take into consideration that it's still often like quite a long journey. So if you find the right person, let's say in a corporate says like, hey, we would like to co-create or co-develop something for you, it might still take, I don't know, a month until you you know get to that decision. So if you're not necessarily like well-funded, then you might sort of like, or the startup might die out in the meantime. So really prepare yourself that corporates are still often working in old-fashioned ways and then, you know, it takes quite some time. Um, so you have to be definitely prepared for, uh, for that part. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. Give a big hand to Pascal Franke, Head of Global Startup Lead and Corporate Entrepreneur at Danske Bank, and Martin Bjergaard, 
stifter af Rainmaking. Tusind tak skal I have, og vi ses igen her om 10 minutter.